Hello and welcome back to The Booth. I'm Gabby Sparks, joined today by Ian Duke. And we are heading into round five here at the Pro... <laughs> I keep doing that. At the <laughs> World Championship. This is the biggest tournament of the year. It sounds like our players are ready as well, so let's head down to the match. Hello, everybody, and welcome to coverage of the 2016 World Championship. I'm Gabby Sparks, joined today by Ian Duke. And here we see on the left, Brian Brondewin. He will be playing at Bant Humans today, and he's battling against Reed Duke. He is playing Turbo Emrakul, and we got to see a little bit of his deck in the last match. Looks like our players are underway here. Uh, they're both sitting at 3-1 and one currently, so off to a very nice start here at the World Championship. And Ban Humans is an interesting choice, Ian. It's not something they usually see, right? We usually see Ban Company. Yeah, that's uh, really interesting. I mean, it is worth mentioning BBD's deck is a collected company deck, but it's not the traditional one. It actually gives up some of the raw power in exchange for human synergies. It's playing um, cards like uh, uh, Thalia, Heretic Cathar. It's playing Knight of the White Orchid. It's playing Thalia's Lieutenant. So it has this like little uh, mm -hmm. humans package as well. Yeah, and from what we saw at the last Pro Tour, a lot of times people kind of veered away from humans because they just felt like uh, company could have better games. So it's interesting. It'll be interesting to talk to Brian and find out what why he felt specifically humans had a good matchup this weekend. Looks like that Vessel of Nascency has been cracked by Reed. So Reed's deck here is what we're calling Turbo Emrakul. It's not exactly the same as Oliver's two list, uh, Oliver 2's list that we just saw a segment on. Uh, I think I think this is Reed's own list that he worked on. It's similar to what he played in the Pro Tour, although in the Pro Tour he was playing uh, just a red-green Turbo Emrakul deck, and here he's picked up blue for some of those Emerge synergies, uh, cards like Elder Deep Fiend and Pilgrim's Eye. So Reed deciding how he wants to sequence the rest of his turns. Yeah, likely just thinking about, okay, what am I doing over the next couple turns? Do I have enough lands to play? Um, what am I going to want to do like three turns from now? Yep. And looks like leading off with a Traverse here. It's going to get him his first mountain. There we see Traverse the Ulven Wall. No Delirium yet. And it looks like that is a Thalia Heretic Cathar on BBD's side of the battlefield. And uh, that actually puts quite a bit of pressure on Reed's mana base, uh, and that is non-basics will come into play tapped. So he needs to think about that a lot when he's sequencing and make sure he doesn't leave himself stuck short of mana on an important turn. And there you see that Primal Druid coming into play tapped, thanks to that Cathar. Which is also really relevant, because the Primal Druid, I'm sure, would love to just jump in front of the Cathar and, and ramp up a little bit, but can't do that for another turn. Here we see uh, BBD's hand, Lamhole Pacifist, Tireless Tracker, Collected Company too. That might be a nice, a nice one for this turn. Company. Okay. Mm, he's gonna main phase it, Ian. Wow. <laughs> oh, and we see a complete brick. Wow. That was insane. So Thalia is going to get in there, and there's going to be a pass back to Reed. But man, you know, one of the interesting things that people talk about is they always say, well, how do you beat a collected company deck? And you know what the first answer they say is? You miss in collected company. <laughs> That's how you lose. Yeah, it's very rare to actually see a, a double miss on collected company. Often you'll see them just pick up one creature. But that was a complete whiff there for BBD. Just down a card and down uh, all four mana on his fourth turn. So really problematic there for BBD. And that gives Reed a little bit of space, perhaps, to ramp up some more and get his defenses online. Yep. Looks like a Pilgrim's Eye Play coming island. down yeah. for Reed. Play Island. Your turn. Picking up an island. 
Now we're going to see a pass back to BBD. Just like a land for the turn. And this is what you were talking about earlier, Ian, that uh, Primal Druid was very eager to jump in front of that yeah. Thalia. He had to wait uh, his turn to finally get to do that. But So Reed ramping up here has uh, quite a powerful hand, actually. We'll take a look at that for you here in just a second. So looking at Reed's hand there, he's got a lot of top end. He's got a copy of Emrakul waiting already that he's ramping up to. He's got an Elder Deep Fiend, which he'll be able to emerge from the Pilgrim's Eye coming up here pretty soon. Uh, he's got Kozlex return to sweep the board. He's really look, looks like he's got a pretty good tool set here uh, to deal with a variety of things. We'll see how he navigates it. Looks like an Elder Deep Fiend is uh, the draw for the turn. Elder Deep Fiend pretty eager to eat things such as Pilgrim's Eye. There is a tireless tracker there for BBD, recouping some of the card advantage he lost when he missed on that collected company. And, you know, potentially a big threat um, going long in the game. But uh, one of the troubles that these ban uh, collected company decks have is they don't really deal with Emrakul all that well. So, well, it's true that BBD will be able to kind of keep up the stream of small-ish creatures coming out. Reed is getting up to that Emrakul pretty quickly and also has access to things like Elder Deep Fiend and Kozlex Return if BBD's board gets too large. Okay. Looks like a grapple from the past end. Uh, um, Emrakul has been milled, Ian, though Reed does have that Emrakul already in hand. Yeah, we might see Reed just grab a land here and make sure he's going to be hitting his land drops for the next couple turns. And if he does do that, he might be telegraphing to BBD also that he does have that Emrakul in hand as well. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah, true. You were right, and he did exactly that. And a fourth untapped land here gives Reed access to Elder Deep Fiend at instant speed here. Coming out of the Pilgrim's Eye. And Reed might go ahead and wait until BBD uh, attacks and then bring in that Elder Deep Fiend. But I'm sure BBD well aware of that and is going to want to sequence his turns that he doesn't get blown out both by a surprise blocker as well as getting his lands tapped down before he can use them. Yeah, and I've also seen, been seeing questions. Um, people are curious about why this is a turbo Emrakul deck as opposed to just a regular Emrakul deck. I think if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, so there's a couple different flavors, I guess. It, it's kind of it's always tricky because the way these players have tuned their decks since the Pro Tour, um, there's kind of like this spectrum of... Um, Eldrazi decks that you can build. Um, the more traditional Teamer Emerge deck mm -hmm. is more focused around things like Elder Deep Fiend, having lots of creatures to emerge out of Primal Druids and Pilgrim Eyes and things like that. And often we'll only play one or, or maybe two copies of Emrakul. Um, and then on the, the other side is um, a deck like Oliver Two's that we just saw where he has three copies of Emrakul and he is very focused on just getting to it as quickly as possible, mm -hmm. uh, giving up some early defense in the name of just ramping up as quickly as you can. Reed's deck is kind of in between the two. He's mm -hmm. got a little bit of Emerge stuff going on, um, but he is more focused on Emrakul as an, as an egg plan. And uh, we'll be able to see that a little bit later on as we get some more deck techs in and get, yeah. get the decks posted. Uh, All right, so it looks like Reed started kind of going off there. B that Kozlek's return was able to clear up some of uh, BBD's board. And now he's playing an Ishkan out, but BBD is responding with, oh man, and these collective companies are not doing work for BBD. And just a couple updates from our back table. Marzo Carvalho is, is up a game against Mike Sigrith, and Seth Manfield is also up a game against Thiago yep. Saperito. So Reed now pretty well set up with a lot of defense in the form of Ishkana and a bunch of spiders. Play tireless tracker. Okay. But BBD hanging into the game with tireless tracker, continuing to give him a card advantage, making okay. clues. 
Ian, I'm okay. getting an update from one of our back tables. Lucas Blohon uh, takes a game uh, between the matchup between him and Ryochi Tamara. And BBD with no attack there. This creature's kind of just small, too small to get through Ishkana. Gives Reed a nice clean untap here. Artifact creature enchantment instant sorcery lands. Six, yeah, seven, and Reed doing oh. the count, as it were. Take your next turn. And here comes Emrakul. Emrakul, the promise then coming down for Reed. Let's take a look at what's going on in BBD's hand. There's a Reflector Mage in Knight of the White Orchid and, and an Evolving Wilds. So let's see uh, how Reed can take advantage of this turn. He's going to attack with all of BBD's creatures. Lambhole Pacifist. The Emrakul's going to get in front of the Lambhole Pacifist. Two spiders in front of the Tally as Lieutenant. And all of these creatures are now dead. <laughs> and BBD had to work so hard to get those creatures on the board since he didn't get them out with Collected Company. <laughs> You're 20 still, right? Yes. Let's see what else Reed can do. Looks like a Reflector Mage. Bouncing back that Ishkana, so Reed going for the value play of replaying that Ishkana. <laughs> <laughs> and Reed sacks the Evolving Wilds. He could look through BBD's deck, but they actually are provided with each other's deck lists here, uh, sort of to equalize the playing field in this World Championship and make sure that scouting isn't an important factor kind of let the players relax and all have access to the same mm -hmm. information. So, Reed, you can see not worrying too much about searching BBD's library there and just uh, failing to find with that Evolving Wilds. And now BBD left with a Lone Reflector Mage and a Knight of the White Orchid in hand. And one important interaction is that Reflector Mage says you can't recast that creature until the Reflector Mage's controller's next uh, turn. Mm -hmm. But that next turn happens right away as the additional turn from the Emrakul. Mm -hmm. So Reed can actually recast uh, Ishkana on the, the next turn. Nice interaction there, you're right. Wow, so BBD with no cards in hand, just a couple of Reflector Mages, and that, and that uh, lone spider on the other side of the battlefield, though. Reed has a full grip of cards. Let's take a look. He's got a Nissa Vast with Seer and Ishkana, two Elder Deep Fiends, and a Grapple with a Past. And while that second Reflector Mage was a pretty big pickup for BBD on his additional turn to bounce back the Emrakul, uh, ultimately, I think Reed is just going to have way too much for BBD to deal with here. Uh, he can't recast the Emrakul this Go. turn because it was Reflector Go. Mage, but he does have a couple Spend Elder Deep Fiends, and he does have a Kozilek's return in his graveyard. And sure enough, that's what we see here. Out of that spider comes an Elder Deep Fiend. Of course, the spider reducing the emer emerge cost by zero, but allowing it to be cast for its emerge cost of mm -hmm. seven, another relevant interaction that might not be totally obvious. And all of the other creatures are dead now. Raid left with that Elder Deep Fiend. All BBD can do this turn is play that Thraven Inspector, crack the clue, and get a card. Another Elder Deep Fiend getting in there. And now I do believe Emrakul is back online, uh, but Reed might not even need to go for it right now. Yeah, he's going for the Nissa play this turn. Transform. Get a land, transform the Nissa. I'll make Shia. Oh, and Reed's getting aggressive here. He's going to tick down and make an Ashaya token. And we'll make three spiders. Yeah. Follow up with Ishkana, make three spiders, pass back to BBD. There we've seen this Sage Animus over on the right. And now Reed has a commanding board presence in this game. Play Tamiya. Mm -hmm. Oh, Tamiyo. Uh, plus on uh, Elder Deep Fiend and Ashaya. Tamiyo Field Researcher taking up, targeting both Elder Deep Fiend and Ashaya. Looks like BBD also had a Thalia's Lieutenant. Got a counter on that Thraben. Inspector. Plus, 
So Nissa Plus gives Reed another gather of the pack, and Reed's still full grip of cards. Even with a Planeswalker, it's going to be difficult for BBD to climb back out of this. Yeah, this is one of those situations where I think Reed just has, like, so many options for how to close out the game that mm -hmm. he's really just thinking through, like, all right, what's the absolute best way to put the nail in the coffin here? Mm -hmm. Just, you know, to make sure I'm taking full advantage of my resources. You know, I might be 95% to win the game from here, but I'll see if I can get that up to a 97% or something like that. That said, you know, we have seen plenty of games where... These Bant decks just kind of runner, runner their way back into it with Dutch watch, Dusk Watch recruiters mm -hmm. and Tamios and things like that. So Reed needs to make sure that he doesn't leave himself open uh, to some kind of angle like that. Looks like Reed is going to attack with all uh, the spiders. The Thalia's lieutenant does die in this exchange. There have been inspectors still around. Go. Turn your upkeep. And Reed continuing to deny Tap BBD of, yeah, of, of his lands this turn. Tapping all four, and BBD has nothing in hand right now. So Notably tapping down all of BBD's green sources this turn, too, mm -hmm. making sure that collecting company isn't a possible draw. Uh, minus Tamiyo on your two defense. So Tamiyo taking down, targeting and both Elder Deep Fiends, time. and then he's just going to pass back to Reed. And it looks like the writing is on the wall for this one. Nissa ticks up, Straight reveals forward. a land, goes straight into play. Those two other creatures still tap down, but it looks uh, like... One at Tamiyo, Tamiyo and eight at you. Yeah, so one That's of the spiders one. going, at attacking Tamiyo, taking care of her. The other creatures all coming at BBD. Reed is going to follow up. That's seven. Take your next turn. For an Emrakul. Force in hand. So Reed deciding what he wants to do this turn. That Thraben Inspector was not long for this world. Gets blocked by Amrakul. Yeah, Reflector Mage is going to bounce that Elder Deep Fiend. Play for us. Done. And that is going to do it. Reed Duke takes game one between him and BBD. We got a lot more magic coming for you this way. Don't go anywhere. We'll see you right after these messages. Whether riding the bus or waiting for the World Championship Finals to begin, Magic Duels is a great way to hone your skills and try new strategies. Featuring hundreds of earnable cards from Magic's latest sets and virtually unlimited AI and online opponents, start playing Magic Duels free today on iPhone, iPad, Xbox One, and Steam. Friday Night Magic is your local hangout where everyone is welcome. Gather with friends at your favorite game store every Friday night. For more info, visit magic.wizards.com slash FNM. Hello and welcome back to coverage of the World Championship. We're going to be moving to the matchup between Mike Sigrist and Marcio Carvalho. Now, Mike Sigrist is going to be playing Teamer Emerge today, and Marcio is on Bant Company. Taking a look at this game. Oh, that's a, that's a long graveyard right there. Looks like an Arwood Dryad and Anissa for Mike Sigrist and uh, a News Constrictor for Marcio. And do note these are our two four and O players coming into this round, so the leaders of the pack here in the World Championship. Uh, go ahead. Looks like Marcio has been missing uh, quite a bit of land drops here. Yeah, it's really surprising to see Mike Sigrist <laughs> with such a large graveyard and uh, Marcio with three permanents on yeah, the board. Three permanents. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And he hasn't found another land. Instead, he just has. A Duskwatch Recruiter and a pass back to Mike. So Mike could run away with this game pretty quickly. He doesn't find another land. And notably, we see two copies of Kozlek's Return already in Mike's graveyard. So even if Marcio is able to just kind of keep pumping out creatures uh, bit by bit, mm -hmm. I can't imagine it will be too long before uh, Mike Sigrist has the ability to cast, say, an Elder Deep Fiend and flash back Kozlek's Return. So Mike looking like he's in a pretty commanding spot right now. And he's going to go ahead and fire off that Ishka now. Delirium is online, so here come three more spiders. 
Now we're going to see a pass back to Marcio. Marcio finds that third land, but is it too little too late? Let's see, two mana. Okay, Declaration in, in Stone takes care of those spiders. But he's still facing down a board of Gnarlwood Dryad, Ishkana, Graf Widow, and the Nyssa. Ziggy thinking about how he wants to sequence this. And what do you think of this matchup in general, Ian? Teamer Emerge versus Band Company. I've heard that it might be pretty decent for Teamer Emerge. That's one of the reasons to play the deck. Yeah, I, I think I definitely agree with that, Gabby. I think um, one of the traditional weaknesses of these base white-green decks is that they don't deal that well with Emrakul. And also, specifically, um, Band Company doesn't deal very well with uh, Kozlux Return. Uh, so, I mean, it's definitely not one-sided. There are opportunities for interaction with things like Spell Queller and so forth, but I think I would rather be on the Teamer Emerge side of this matchup. Yeah, and the Teamer Emerge side of the matchup, Triumph. Yeah. All right, let's move back to our main match for now. Taking a look at the players' sideboards, and this is our first time sideboarding as well, do you think... Uh, BBD just wants to try to get aggressive against something like Turbo Emrakul. Uh, let's take a look here. I mean, he's got he's got some interesting options here. Um, cards like Negate are definitely potential things that you can bring in. Maybe stop a, an early Nissa's Pilgrimage or something mm -hmm. along those lines. Um, but that being said, I don't think there's too many ways that BBD can really tweak and optimize his deck uh, against what Reed's trying to do. Uh, he's probably just um, you know, shaving a couple things and probably bringing in Gideons maybe for just a little extra kind of mid-game power. And just a quick update from one of our back tables. Lucas Blahone actually wins his match against Ryochi Tamada. That was a Jen Delirium versus Band Company. Both players are sitting at 2-2. Two and two. And Reed and BBD having a little bit of kind of playful banter in between the games as they shuffle up. I think Reed there just acknowledging that BBD got a total of one power and toughness off of both of his collected companies combined last game. So yeah. acknowledging the misfortune there. <laughs> it is. It was very, very unlucky there. You take a look at Reed. And we can see the venue from here. The venue is absolutely stunning. Yeah, it truly is. Just It's all decked out with, you know, Kaladeshi-style mm -hmm. uh, accoutrements and uh, motifs. Well, the one thing that's really nice is that we're in the Paramount Theater, Ian. Mm -hmm. And the Paramount Theater itself looks like it has a lot of filigree and it looks a lot like Kaladesh. So aside from what you see here in the beautiful view, this is not just part of Kaladesh. The theater itself looks like it's part of Kaladesh. Yeah, and make sure you check out some of the coverage we have coming up for PAX throughout the weekend. You'll get to see things like the world building panel for Kaladesh. And mm -hmm. You can see the beautiful artwork and all the, the work that went into creating the characters and the, the scenery and everything. Uh, really, really awesome. There's going to be a great street fair. We're closing down one of the one of the streets nearby here, and there's going to be awesome showings of glass blowing and thopter building, oh, super am am cool. among other things. Yeah, I can't so wait to see it. That should be very cool to check out. So it looks like the players here are just still shuffling up. It's possible that BBD took a mulligan it here. I'm not sure. Yeah, it looks like BBD has taken a mulligan. Oh, he's actually going to five. Okay. Luck has not broken his way in this match so far. Yeah, it's definitely true. That said, I mean, uh, these uh, Bant Collected Company decks, or th this uh, Bant Humans, I guess, that uh, BBD is playing, definitely can recover from a mulligan to five. You have cards like Duskwatch Recruiter and Collected Company and Tireless Tracker um, as things that can kind of get you a stream of cards going into the mid-game. So I would not count BBD out of this just yet. Wow, so only two four drops in his hand. He has three lands, a Gideon and a Collected Company. Looks like BBD is going to kick us off with an Evolving Wilds. BBD fetching that forest from his deck. And he's going to go, he's gonna have to get pretty lucky here. 
Ooh, Oops. Athalia is a nice pickup there for VD. Oh, that is a really nice pickup here, especially looking at Reed's hand here. He has a lot of non-basic lands, so that could really slow Reed down. Uh, that said, Reed's hand overall looking pretty solid. He's got Primal Druid this turn, Pilgrim's Eye the next, and then before you know it, he's on to Elder Deep Fiends uh, with Grapple with the Past as an option to re recover later on in the game. So Thalia, Heretic, Cathar does come down for BBD. And this could keep Reed off of Pilgrim's Eye this turn, which would slow him down considerably. And here we saw that a play, Shivan Reef coming down top for Reed. Thalia starting to do some work. Looks like Reflector Mage is going to take care of this Druid temporarily. And that's a really big deal because that lets the Thalia come in for, for three damage. If it weren't for that Reflector Mage, you could actually consider just not attacking with Thalia there because mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to give Reed the extra ramp. Uh, yeah, that's a very good blocking. point, Ian. Reed casting grapple with a past. So despite the fact that BBD Mulligan down to five, I actually like his start here quite a bit. He didn't have a two drop, which is unfortunate, um, but he's definitely in a spot where, you know, He's a collected company or two away from uh, being back into this game. So Reed thinking about how he wants to sequence this. He actually has so much in hand. He has three Elder Deep Fiends, Vessel of Nascency, Shrine of the Forsaken Gods, a Pilgrim's Eye, and a Primal Druid. And we can see how much that Thalia has affected Reed here. Um, if it weren't for that, he would have been able to spend three mana last turn instead, mm -hmm. of, instead of just uh, grappling. Uh, casting Pilgrim's Eye, and then he'd have Elder Deep Fiend online right right now. He could start tapping down BBD's mana before BBD can cast all the cards in his hand. Unfortunately, so. it's only now that Pilgrim's Eye comes down and it enters the battlefield tapped. Mm -hmm. and yeah, so Thalia doing some serious work here, uh, making, making Reed's turns a little bit clunky, and though, you know, it is important to remember BBD did mulligan to five this game, and he's going to have to get pretty lucky considering... All he has in hand is a Gideon Allies and the Car Collected Company. This time, the Collected Company cannot possibly miss. <laughs> he used up all his, uh, yeah, his he's, bad he's, luck. He ran fortune. out of bad luck. Yeah. It's going to be great now. That's the way it works. Looks like Gideon, Ally of Zendikar. Yeah, this was a, a card that was talked about a lot at the last Pro Tour. Obviously, Gideon, super powerful card in general, but um, it was also a card that a lot of the Emrakul players noted that they feared. And I think that for that reason, that's something that's coming out of BBD's sideboard here, um, just to give him an extra fast clock, extra power in the mid game, something that's just really difficult for Reed to deal with. Doesn't die to Kozlek's return. Mm -hmm. That's super nice, especially considering how much of BBD's board does die to Kozlek's return. Mm -hmm. Reed's hand a little bit on the clunky side. He does have three copies of Elder Deep Fiend, which he could use to maneuver a little bit, maybe try to tap down some of BBD's creatures, get in a hit on the Gideon, and maybe finish the Gideon off. Um, but he hasn't found a Kozlex return yet, which is really noteworthy. Yeah, and then the front Shrine of the Forsaken God's coming into play tapped as well. Looks like Dramaka's Command is a pickup for BBD. So what Reed's done here is he's left up his mana for the Vessel of Nascency. He has the option to use that. He also has the option to cast his Elder Deep Fiend. And it uh, looks like he is doing this before BBD is attacking. All right, so this is at the beginning of combat step. Reed is going to cast that Elder Deep Fiend, emerging the Pilgrim's Eye. Oh, float of blue. Comes to play. All right, so tapping down all of BBD's creatures in the blue, but BBD did float a blue. He could also fire off that collected company. All right, time to get lucky, BBD. Yeah. Okay. I see two reflector mages. <laughs> Getting an update from one of our back tables. It looks like Seth Manfield wins his match against Tiago Saperito. Seth was playing Bant Spirits, and Tiago Saperito was playing Bant Company. Looks like BBD actually with t 
tons of options here. I think there's actually all three reflector mages there, um, as well as a three bit inspector and a lamb hold pacifist. So he can certainly uh, reflector mage the deep fiend, and looks like he goes with the pacifist as the other choice there. Now it's important to note actually that um, we now know that all of BBD's reflector mages are accounted for. I think there's two on the bottom of his library now and two on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to keep that in mind going forward if there's a, a spot where he really needs to find one. And that's something that Reed is certainly keenly aware of. Well, actually, Reed wouldn't be aware of it, right? Because Collected Company, you don't have to reveal them. You just have to sure. show them from afterwards. So Fair BBD enough. knows that he can't find another one, but Reed doesn't know that. Fair idea. enough. And this is pretty awkward for Reed because uh, with the Elder Deep Fiend having been Reflector Maged, now Reed has three cards in his hand that he can't cast this turn. And he's under quite a bit of pressure here. Now remember, this is the game where BBD mulliganed down to five, and look at how big his board is here. This is really a testament to the power of Gideon and Collected Company, just able to churn out permanents onto the battlefield very quickly. Oh, but Reed has found Kozilek's Jeez. return. That is tremendous. That is exactly what he needed. Ten. Cool. Looks like Primal Druid is a follow-up. But now that Kozilek's return is just in the graveyard waiting to be recast. That's right, yeah. It's super important there, Reed, that, uh, that Reed also had the Primal Druid there because otherwise he would be dead on board to the Gideon Animate plus Gideon. one, or uh, animating into a 5-5. A five five. Uh, Gideon fights Primal Druid, you suck an enchantment. And sure enough, here comes Dromica's command on the animated Gideon, and that'll clear the path, and Reed has to scoop them up. So that is a loss for wow. Reed after a mulligan to five for BBD, tying it up one to one. We're going to be looking at uh, one of our back tables, Mike Sigris versus Marcio Carvalho. Mm -hmm. Both players sitting at 4-0, and, and this is currently game three. Uh, All right, looks like a collected company was just cast by Marcio, and it resolves. Let's see what he finds off the top. Looks like a reflector mage, a selfless spirit, a couple of reflector mages. All right, so he's going to choose selfless spirit and reflector mage. This is on the battlefield, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Having to clear up his graveyard a little bit. Quite there's a uh, there's quite a bit going on there. Gonna go ahead and crack that Evolving Wilds right now. This is looking like a pretty contested game here, Gabby. Both players with lots of cards in hand and lots of permanents on the battlefield. Those Ishkanas spiders look to be holding off uh, Carvalho's army for the moment. But it uh, looks like both players with a lot more gas in the tank. Let's see what Siggy wants to follow up with. Looks like three mana for a Kozilex return. And this is going to clear away that uh, selfless spirit. So I imagine we're seeing end of turn Kozlek's return into then untapping and being able to flash it back. And it looks like that Reflector Mage targeted that uh, Ishkana, so it goes back into Siggy's hand. Oh, I see. Okay, so that was Collected Company on Siggy's turn, mm -hmm. putting Reflector Mage, targeting the Ish Ishkana, and then in response, a um, Kozlek's return. So at least most of Marcio's board gets to survive there, though that selfless spirit is is now gone. Also, that Jay sitting at a very high loyalty count at this point. Twenty twenty. 
you, right? Yeah. This looks like a bit of a tough spot for Mike Sigrist. He's going to be taking a bunch of damage this turn. Uh, either that or his Jace might be dying. And he only has six lands on the battlefield, so he can't, for example, cast an Elder Deep Fiend very easily on the following turn. Um, unless he has a creature to cast and emerge from. There's a possibility there. So Marcio going to emblem that Gideon. I'm sure uh, our lovely table judges will... Get a Gideon emblem here. So everything is coming at Jace, and that does oh, yeah, yeah. kill that Jace. It does not. It actually leaves it at one. Yeah. Right. That uh, would be nine damage, but presumably the Jace used its plus ability on one of those creatures last turn. So only takes seven, goes down to one loyalty. And another Jace coming down from Arceo. This time it's making a soldier. So grapple resolving here for Mike Sigrist, looking over what his options are. We'll be bringing you updates of what happens in this match, but we're moving back to our main match, uh, BBD versus Reed Duke. Looks like our players are underway. And uh, Reed leads off with a Vessel of Nascency. The Raven Inspector yep. and planes from BBD. Let me see a pass back to Reed. Wretched Griff is a draw for him. Your turn. All right, Primal Druid coming down for a read. We're going to see a pass back to BBD. Looks like Lamhole Pacifist is the play for Brian. There you see on the right that the Raven Inspector. Kay. This is Pilgrimage. And taking a look at Reed's hand, this is Pilgrimage, a really nice big pickup for him, although. Noteworthy that he is sitting on only forests at the moment. Uh, in Reed's hand, we have a couple copies of Wretched Griff and another Primal Druid. But kind of hard for him to unlock uh, the colors that he needs right now. He'll have to try and chump block with Primal Druid if he can. Valley's Lieutenant coming down from BD gets counters on all his humans. And the important interaction there, uh, Lamholt Pacifist with a plus and plus one counter actually sees itself as a four power creature, allowing it to attack. And Reed, I have to imagine, is going to want to chump block here, but perhaps thinking about what land type he wants to get and uh, not wanting to reveal that by taking a long time searching his library. He's trying to decide first, maybe, and then blocking. And the reason Reed needs to decide carefully about his land type is he does have Wretched Griffs in his hand, but he also has Radiant Flames, I believe. So whether he gets blue or red mana would be pretty okay. relevant mm -hmm. here. Yes. But actually, indeed, looks like he's just going to go ahead and block the Thraben Inspector and keep the Primal Druid alive, uh, perhaps val valuing the ability to emerge more than getting another land right now. Yeah, and we do know that uh, Reed has those two Wretched Griffs in hand, so the, that definitely could be relevant down the line. And I think Reed picked up a copy of Cinderglade this turn, which is a really big deal. Uh, and finding some mana and then has option to find Island off this. So he will be able to get his his lands online here pretty soon. But facing down a decent amount of pressure from BBD. So he does take that Island. Yep. And with that Cinderglade as well, he's now firing on all cylinders. There it is. BBD's going to crack that Evolving Wild at the end of his turn. BBD now also with all his colors. And I think what Reed's hoping will happen here is that uh, Brian will further extend playing a couple more creatures out, and then Reed can sweep them away with the Radiant Flames. Planes as a pickup for BBD this turn. It's 
got a couple of tireless trackers, a reflector mage, and a collected company in hand. He has a lot of options. Yeah, looks like he did pick up a land that turn, which is really important because this lets him put uh, hold up collected company rather than just playing some more creatures on his own turn. And that's super relevant if Reed's plan is to cast a sweeper. Okay. So I take three damage on a 13. I'm going to search. This time the Primal Druid gets under the bus in front of that in front of that Lamhole Pacifist. So this is going to help ramp Reed up a little bit, but no more blockers for him. Looks like BBD has opted not to play that tireless tracker either since he has played his land already. Alright, so I'll pass the turn. Draw. Sure. Draw. We'll see what Reed picked up here. Still those Wretched Griffs in hand, the Radiant Flames you mentioned before, too. It looks like the Wretched, the first Wretched Griff is coming down. I will. So that's when you cast that you draw, right? Yep. Okay, you can draw. I may have a response before it enters the battlefield. Mm -hmm. I'm going to cast Blood to Company. Yeah, so it looks before like it uh, Reed is allowed to draw a card, but BBD is responding to the Wretched Griff entering the battlefield. <laughs> that was bad timing, I guess. Uh, I will use the Knight's ability, though. Uh, and I'm going to put two triggers on this. Okay. And I'm going to search for a... Uh, so BBD's collected company is actually, actually functional this time. <laughs> it is, although there's a very relevant thing there, which mm -hmm. BBD actually cast a collected company with the Griff on the stack. I believe the reason he did that is if he were to hit Thalia, then the Griff would enter the battlefield tapped. The downside is if the Griff isn't on the battlefield yet, if he hits a Reflector Mage, then he can't bounce it back to Reed's hand. So he kind of made the wrong sort of 50-50-ish mm -hmm. call on that one, uh, given that he did hit the Reflector Mage. That said, I mean, BBD is in really good shape right now. He's got a huge mm -hmm. board. All Reed has is one measly blocker. And uh, we're going to see a big turn coming up here for BBD. And in all fairness, too, the, the Wretched Griff does draw BBD a card, or does draw uh, Reed a card when it is cast. So it is, it feels a little bad to bounce him back. Yeah, that's definitely true. But I, I think BBD just has so much damage on the board that uh, he was just hoping to get past that Griff in some way. Uh, and yeah, I agree. It, it would have been optimal for him if he hit a Thalia mm. there, but... Uh, reflector mage this mm, but the second Reflector Mage does take Four, care of that five, Griff. Six, and ten, it looks like the whole 14, team is getting in. They're counting up. Yep, that's and lethal. And there's a handshake. Okay. That is lethal. <laughs> BBD moves on to 4-1 and one here at the World Championship. The players talking to each other about uh, BBD's good five. Yeah, that second game, game was actually really incredible. Yeah, BBD incredible had a mulligan to five on the play, and uh, I think Thalia did a ton of work that game for him. We're going to move back and see what's going on between Mike Sigrist and Marcio Carvalho. These players were both sitting at 4-0. This is Team Room Merger versus Band Company. We've got to do a couple live look-ins here, but oh, there's an Umrakul cool of Promise Send over on Mike's side of the battlefield. Both players sitting comfortably at 20 life so far, but Emrakul the Promise then can end games very quickly. So this is Marcio's turn, being controlled by Mike Sigrist. Yeah, it looks like it is going to be a good turn for, for Siggy here. He could, for example, play a second Gideon, um, Planeswalker rule away the first one, then minus the second one to make an emblem and attack the Sylvan Advocate into the Emrakul, and that would leave uh, Marcio with basically nothing. That's just one option, though. We'll see what Siggy decides to do. It's 20 to 20, correct? Mm. And this is exile. This is exile, correct? I don't think so. You'll oh, no, no, I blocked block it. The, it. Um. the player's keeping track of exiled and graveyard. There's so much going on in these games. Mm. I suppose another option would be to activate the Gideon into a creature and then cast Elder Deep Fiend and emerge from it, but looks like, yeah, Sige, I think, mm -hmm. is going with the first play. So off goes to the graveyard by Gideon. Yeah. 
There it is. So two emblems for Marsu, but no creatures. Marsu's draw for the turn is a tireless tracker. Sullivan Advocate followed up by the tireless tracker. And those are some big creatures benefiting from two Gideon emblems, so plus two, plus two apiece. But uh, Siggy's in a really good spot here. I mean, he, we might just see him cracking with Emrakul twice in a row, and, and that'll be game. Um, he's just going to have to make sure he doesn't leave himself somehow too vulnerable uh, to what Carvalho has on board and try to make sure that you know, Carvalho doesn't draw something like a Reflector Mage mm -hmm. to help get himself back into the game. Now, we, I think Carvalho had an Elder Deep Fiend in his hand. Is that right? Did we see that the previous turn? Uh, yeah, he actually does. So he that's currently ha yeah, he currently has one in hand, along with a Duskwatch Recruiter and a Summary Dismissal. Okay, that's a, an unusual uh, addition to a, a more traditional Bant Company deck, um, but it's definitely something Siggy needs to be aware of here to make sure he doesn't leave himself uh, in a vulnerable spot to getting his Emrakul tapped down. Looks like Siggy's going to go for that Ishkana. I like this a lot. Spiders. It's just a nice, safe play. Puts lots of creatures out of the battlefield, mm -hmm. so it doesn't leave himself as open to um, the Elder Deep Fiend. And even though his Emrakul might not be able to finish the job next turn, it'll still stick around and uh, hopefully hang in there for winning two turns from now. And they're all dried coming down, too. And yes, he the shields up are, are up here for Mike. So this is a, a pass back to Marsu, but in Marsu's upkeep, Mike has the choice to cast this Elder Deep Fiend, sacking that Ishkana. And this is super important because this lets Siggy tap down Marcio Carvalho's island, um, which will force Marcio to cast the Elder Deep Fiend this turn instead of leaving it up to play defensively on Mike's following turn. So I believe we will see Mike's Emrakul finish the job here. Oh, but he drew a wow, Reflector, Reflector Mage, Mage too. Almost, almost in time, but you're right. That Elder Deep Fiend is able to do it there for Mike Sigris. He moves on to 5-0 here at the World Championship. Can I keep this? Yeah. And it's hard to emphasize, 5-0 is just an incredible start oh here. Yeah. Um, you know, we're used to Pro Tours and Grand Prix where maybe getting your, your second loss is like, um, you know, you're out of contention or whatever. But uh, here at the World Championship, these players are going to be battling that. It's a small group of players, and they're playing a whole bunch of rounds. So uh, getting off to a 5-0 uh, no lead is putting you in a great spot, even if you pick up a couple more losses along the way. Yeah, not just that here at the World Championship, each round is worth pro points. So, mm -hmm. you know, th every single round is really meaningful. So being off to a 5-0 start, I'm sure he's feeling great. And, uh, man, we had some really good matches, too, specifically BBD on that mulligan to five. That yeah. was really impressive. That, that was very, very impressive to see him come back in that game. So, yeah, it's been some awesome magic yeah. here so far in these first two rounds of Standard, and we can't wait to see two more rounds coming up. Mm -hmm. Now it's time to send it over to Rich over at the balcony. Thanks, Gabby. Thanks, Ian. Great stuff there. So Mike Sigrist leads the World Championship at 5-0. and He's in sole possession of the lead. Marcio Carvalho, the draft master, at 4-1. and one. Now, one of the great things that happens at the World Championships is that players can play each other a whole bunch of times. First thing this morning, let's go right back to round number one. Seth Manfield, the reigning world champion, his first draft opponent is Thiago Saparito of Brazil. Saparito wins that match, reigning world champion, to 0-1. Manfield roars back in draft 1-1, 2-1, begins standard with a win, 3-1. Round number five just gone, who does he play? It's round two against Thiago Saparito, and this time in Constructed, Seth Manfield gets the job done. Manfield is up to four and one. Thiago Saparito falls to three and two. Who knows, they could meet again tomorrow morning in draft. If they're in the same pod, they could meet again on Saturday in Modern. They could ultimately play a fifth time on Sunday in the final four. So. These little rivalries work their way through. We've seen it with Patrick Chapin in past years and Shahar Shenha. It's one of the great underlying stories. But right now, there are matches still going on. Let's get down to the floor. Our roving reporter, Brian David Marshall, is there for us. BDM, who have you got? 
Bonus magic for the first time in this tournament, Rich. I've got Andre Strasky and Martin Mueller playing over there. Over here, you see uh, Shota Yasuka is, well, he's playing nobody at the moment. I don't know what's going on over there. But the match we're looking at right here is Paulo Vitor Dominarosa, the Hall of Famer, versus Oath of the Gatewatch Pro Tour champion, JC Tao. And as you can see, the board is a Pilgrim's Eye and an Emrakul for Paulo versus Tireless Tracker, or Tireless Tracker with two counters, a zombie, and uh, Nissa Sage Animist, and a Liliana Last Hope. There's a Lashweed Lurker for Paulo Vitra Dominarosa, and he attacks Emrakul in, and he is looking at attacking Nissa Sage Animist there. But now he's considering things, and I can tell you that the life totals are 28 for JC versus a mere seven for Paulo Vitor Domodorosa. So Tau is actually uh, one win ahead of Paolo. Paolo is at two and two. JC is at three and one coming in. So Tau is paired down, if you will, against Paolo. So uh, a little more important for Paolo to make up some ground and try and get to three and two. JC Tau would be just one win off the lead if he can get this one and get to four and one. Yeah, but if he does it, he's going to have to do it through a pair of Eldrazi with an Emrakul and a Lashweed Larker in play. Also worth saying that the players, uh, they are timed in these rounds. It's 60 minutes. They get more than at the Pro Tour, 50 traditionally at the Pro Tour, full 60 minutes, but it is still timed. And that means that we're not too far away from the end of the round. But uh, I don't believe time constraints. There you see top left, nine and a half minutes to go for these two. So this standard deck that uh, JC's playing is the, the Green Black Delirium deck. It's the same deck he played at the Pro Tour. And I know he felt uh, pretty comfortable with it. Right, and a similar uh, deck to uh, what Sam Pardy played, right? Uh, Sam was also Black Green Delirium uh, at the PT. So there you see an activation for Liliana, just sort of notching Emrakul down a little. Plays a tireless tracker, plays a land, makes a clue. He's 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 got quite an investigation there going. Actually, he's got four <laughs> clues. The other matches that are outstanding: Andrea Mingucci against Shota Yasuoka. They are both at two and two, coming in, and Andre Strasky against Martin Muller, an all-European clash. They are both at one and three. At two and three, you're in the thick of the mix. At one and four, it is a very, very long road back towards the top four. JC Tao is cracking clues, growing his tireless trackers, digging for cards. One loss for Brazil already this round. Saparito falling to Seth Manfield. Saparito at three and two. Manfield up to four and one. Paolo looking to get back uh, ahead and uh, get himself to three and two. JC sends his tireless tracker into the Lashweed Larker and the two creatures trade. And then here's a Sylvan Advocate BDM coming down for JC. You know, an Emrakul promised an end, but it is uh, not delivering thus far here and has a lot of work to do. JC is more than two attacks away from being uh, killed by that. He is still at 28, Paulo still at seven. So, uh, gather the pack for Paulo Vitor Domnerosa. That looks like a whiff. And he follows it up with Grapple of the Past. That looks like a very, very large graveyard BDM and not a very large library. They, they are almost uh, equidistant from the bottom of the table. Almost. 
Yeah, it's almost at the point where I'm starting to wonder how many cards are left in Paolo's library. It, it looks like it's uh, at least 20. Oh, okay. From, from this angle, it doesn't look like very much, but fair enough. Ooh, handshake time. Wow, and Paolo extends the hand and uh, JC Tao uh, takes a match. He just has the numbers on him there on the board. Uh, even though Emrakul is a 13-13, they couldn't deal with multiple creatures. Uh, so uh, Paolo Vidadama de Rosa uh, stays at two wins. JC Tau is up to four. Um, and uh, if you want to come back here, we can certainly do that while BDM finds uh, more on the floor. Um, we're seeing what else is going on there. Uh, Muller and Strasky are still going. Uh, there you see them. Muller on the left of your screen. Andre Strasky uh, on the right. Martin Muller, World Magic Cup, the Great Dane. Uh, battling away here, but this has not been a great start for either of them. Remember, they only have one win apiece, and it looks like, yeah. Oh, well, there's handshake there. Well, so, uh, Brian, we can we have a winner there? just in time for the handshake, but uh, there is still one more match. Uh, Shoti Asaoka and Andrea Mangucci. And uh, this is looking like a bant mirror. And Andrea Mangucci has had quite a bit of success with this band deck on the Pro Tour. Mm -hmm. Uh, but he is up against it here. Yasuka at a hearty 20 life, while Minguchi is sitting on just six, facing down Thalia, Tireless Tracker, and a Selfless Spirit. So Dromica's command is to play from Minguchi, takes out Thalia, and he activates Jace. Last match of the round, remember, this is round five. Two more rounds to come of standard. Tomorrow we will draft again in the afternoon. Before that, it is Kaladesh all the way, starting at 11 a.m. Pacific time. Set your watches, make sure you see our opening ceremony for PAX and the beginning of the Kaladesh uh, roller coaster ride, which is just going to be great. So, again, Mangucci is just at six life here. All right, Shoti Asuka untaps. And now it's his turn to draw the Dromica's Command that is such a big part of this band company deck. Yeah, I was chatting BDM with uh, Matei in our standard preview about how some decks were starting to shave off uh, numbers of uh, Dromica's Command, but interesting to see uh, that here it is a, it's going to be potentially a big deal as time ticks down, just three minutes left on the round. Shota does have two clues in place, so he can grow his tireless tracker. He just has to find six damage. But it is shrunk by Jace at the moment. I can tell you, BDM, that Andre Strasky was the winner of that European clash. So Martin Muller, who a lot of people thought was maybe one of the darker horses for this tournament, has opened up one and four in big trouble. Andre Strasky at two and three alongside Paolo Vida, Dama de Rosa. Uh, Ryochi Tamada is there. Yuya Watanabe is at two and three. So just no easy matches wherever you are in the standings. But there's the handshake. There you have it. Dromica's command uh, still able to find five power to uh, fight with the other tireless tracker. And that gave Andrea Mangucci uh, no, no way to not take six. And uh, that's it here on the floor for this round is standard. We're going to send it back up to you at the desk, Rich. Brian, thanks so much. Great stuff down there on the floor. Good to get you a little bit of that action from the back tables. Pallavi de Dama de Rosa falls. He's at two and three. JC Tao, who was paired down up to four and one. So he's only one win off the pace. That pace is being set by Mike Sigrist of the United States, former player of the year. 5-0, the only remaining perfect record. Your four and ones, Marcio Carvalho, Seth Manfield, Brian Braun-Duin, JC Tao. Those are your front five as we head down the stretch of Standard. Two more rounds to come. But if you've been watching Standard with us this afternoon, I'm sure you've been chuckling inanely 
as we've seen the fun that is the Crush of Tentacles deck of Steve Rubin in action. We wanted to find out all the nooks and crannies of the Crush deck, and he's crushing with it right now. He's over at the deck tech wall with Matei Zatalkai.